Welcome back, Warriors. We are Woo-hoo! so excited to be dropping today's episode with uh, an amazing guest named James Woods. Yeah. At Yoga Dude. Love him. He was such a dynamic guest. And uh, before Abby gets into a little bit of a recap of our conversation, let me tell you all a little bit about James Woods. James Woods has his master's in counseling and is a registered yoga teacher. As president of Feel Free to Feel Free, a health and wellness organization that provides programs and services for youth and adults who serve them, he trains and holds workshops on self-care, yoga, meditation, and mindfulness. Timmy Tut is the first book from James that fulfills his passions of sharing wellness tools through a literary experience to better serve the youth. James is also the founder of Million Man Meditation, a wellness resource event featuring all Black men. This was a great conversation. Yes. Uh, I, I know that we both said that it felt very, um, non-anxiety inducing for us talking to James. Yeah. It felt like talking to a friend, even though we'd all never met before. Um, so this conversation was, you know, I mean, I say this every time, but it was, it was fun. You'll hear during the podcast, there was actually like a lot of laughter. Um, there was some fun nineties references, Um, so James starts by telling a story basically about how from the time he was an infant, the message he was getting was that other people won't meet your needs. Um, it's up to you to have to meet your needs. Um, and so he shares his journey of, you know, going to elementary school, high school, always feeling like he needed to meet his own needs. Um, but also feeling like in that he wasn't really feeling enough, which many of us can relate to. Uh, And, you know, he when he went to college, he literally tried on multiple hats to see and figure out who he was. And he realized that putting on hats, you know, and changing his appearance wasn't what was going to shift on the inside, um, but it was being able to connect to his authentic self and notice and realize that he can be accepted as his authentic self. Um, He shares this beautiful story of working with young men who called him out (laughs) on who he was. And he realized that, you know, in order to serve these young men, in order to be of service, um, he had to be his authentic self and he had to be his human self to actually help these boys. Um, This was, like we just said, a really fun conversation. Um, It was really, really comfortable and um, it was just something I really enjoy. He's just such a um, beautiful speaker. Uh, and so I feel like this podcast could have been like a two hour podcast. <laughs> um, so yes. yeah, so hopefully you all enjoy this episode. Yes, enjoy everyone. Here's the show. Hey, James, welcome to the Anxiety Warriors podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. Really appreciate being here. Yeah. So we're going to just jump right in. Uh, one of the questions we love to start out asking all of our guests is to share a little bit about your journey, your story uh, surrounding anxiety. Cool, cool, cool. So me really discovering my journey and myself and anxiety has been an ongoing and continuous um, search and journey within itself. But I would really say me recognizing my anxiety started as I um, kind of started getting into the work of yoga and work of mental health and therapy. And my original background in education is I have a marriage and family therapy degree. So in the state of California, we're, you know, I'm a therapist and really hearing and understanding the different things that were going on in education. Like, Hey, this means that you're anxious. This means that you're depressed. This means that you're going through this or that and uh, starting kind of to recognize I fit some of those boxes. Mm. Those are some of the things that I, I describe myself as, or I've been even kind of suppressing or not even really addressing because um, just kind of make it through, trying to keep it pushing, trying to keep it going. But after beginning to have labels, even even examples of what anxiety looks like, started kind of recognizing within myself. And then of course, getting older, more relationships, more, jobs more experiences I've had that anxiety just keep coming up it just keeps getting pulled out of me the more I I try to press forward the more I try to uh, build on my career and and interpersonal relationships the more I just try to be me the more anxiety comes up and uh, the more I feel like I get the tools to deal with it 
the more it transforms and shows itself in different ways. So I would definitely say as a kid, a lot of my anxiety probably was based in the foundation and uh, just being raised by great parents, amazing parents, 40 year anniversary they celebrating this year. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's no joke. My parents just hit 55 years. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a long time to know one person. Yes. Um, yeah. That makes me anxious. Just thinking about it right there. <laughs> um, but growing up in the eighties, what am I? 86. And I think my mom was telling me, she just heard or learned or somebody told her about a technique of raising kids where you kind of just let them cry. Mm-hmm. You let them self-soothe. I don't know if that was the word around it, but You let them cry out so they don't be spoiled, so they know how to take care of themselves. So they just kind of figure it out. So she told me that was kind of her her method of of how um, she kind of let me deal with crying and initially in a lot of those first years. And as I got education and learning, hey, children cry for a reason. Mm -hmm. They need that attention. They need that affection. They need a diaper change. I'm hungry. It is a signal that I'm communicating to you. And if I start finding out that man, I'm vocalizing, I need you, I need somebody, and I'm not getting my needs met. Uh, it just introduces people to a world of unmet needs, and that's yes. an anxious world to be in and a confusing world to be in. So I think that's a little bit of part of it, and as well as my mom growing up with uh, an abusive father. My grandfather was abusive with my uh, grandmother. Mm. Back in the day, uh, especially as Black men, you go out in the world, you get called all types of N words and boys, and you less of a man. You come home, and a lot of times you take it out on those close to you. Yeah. Mix in alcohol abuse, um, mix in a lot of the res- the lack of a lot of the resources and attention to mental health and the justices that we have now, and you can have an abusive relationship. And I think my mom saw that a lot just within the black men in our community. Mm. Um, men get older they become violent they become aggressive they abuse women so she really wanted to instill that power over me as a child as in hey you're gonna be bigger than me one day you're gonna be a grown man but you ain't gonna put your hands on me you ain't gonna disrespect me so you know she would physically punish me she would whoop me yeah sometimes for no reason but just to instill that fear within me as a child um fear equated love and respect in her mind so um I think those even as I talk about them and think about them they make me anxious to think about it um Mm -hmm. and being in children's lives now who have suffered different traumas the label we use on it now I can see how that can make anybody anxious and um growing up trying to establish a sense of who I am um but always carrying around that um that idea, I think, in my head, in my space, that nobody's really going to be there to meet my needs. Right. It has to be me. And um, sometimes I deserve to be, uh, you know, punished or whatever, even if I didn't do anything. I think that energy is kind of going over there. And yeah. it's uh, it's funny, me and my mom, we're going on a trip uh, next month. We're taking a trip to the Midwest. We both really never been to the Midwest. Mm. So it's been a, a lot of... Uh, we were going to Chicago, Detroit, Indiana, Wisconsin, maybe. She wants to see all 50 states. And so I'm going to rock with her and go with her. Nice. But um, yeah, definitely some early years building anxiety and then just continue to grow up as a, just a little black boy trying to figure out his own way. Right. A lot of times being the only black boy in class um, in certain areas and trying to fit in mentally, trying to fit in uh, physically and uh, carrying that anxiety along with me so yeah I think I think I think you can uh, label some of those things the foundations of my anxiety and beginnings there yeah uh, yeah I'm, I'm I'm comfortable saying that <laughs> it's you know it's there's there's so many there's so many things in your story um and but it just it sounds what it really sounds like is you started off in like the 80s were they were terrible, like terrible <laughs> things happen to children all the time. And people are like, well, kids are resilient. Who cares? We're fine. Right. We're, I mean, we were born <laughs> in the eighties as well. Early eighties, yeah. earlier than you, but yeah. We're, we're... 
And, and so, you know, that part about like, just let babies cry it out. Right. Is like, we know now how misinformed that is because exactly like what you learned as like an infant without the language was that my needs won't get met. Right. I need to do this on my own. I need to figure out how to protect myself and allow myself to survive ultimately. Um, because that's the message babies get when they're crying and no one helps them and they don't know like, oh, the therapists are saying, let them cry it out. (laughs) Like, right, 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 right. So like, that's such a foundational piece that you've Mm -hmm. then grown your life around. And it wasn't until you said it was during your graduate, um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you were reading stuff and you're like, wait a second, (laughs) right anxiety depression like this this sounds like a little like me and so your right. whole life until then was having all mm-hmm. this anxiety and protection needing to protect yourself um right. and I just I think that that part right there is just like how as kids we're carrying this around and we have no idea how to make sense of it no idea how to make sense of yeah. it and as you said we carry it from one stage to another stage and especially as a young boy who was essentially doing what I was supposed to do. I was going to school. Uh, and then as I got older, I'm, I'm working a job. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But still, there's that underlying feeling within me of, hey, you know, um, maybe if I do the next thing, my needs will be met. Maybe if I do the next thing after I graduate school, after I get this job, after I do this, after I do that, you know, it yeah. continues to keep going. And um, it was a, I was having a conversation with some older gentlemen and we're talking about how a lot of the older folks got actual skills and tools. They may not have been compassionate, but they got skills mm-hmm. and tools to navigate the world. You get a job, you do this, and that's your purpose. That's what you do. But we, I think we got a lot of um, just praise and self-esteem. So, hey, good job. You can be a president if you want to. You can do anything. If you stay away from drugs, if you do a lot of stuff that kind of wasn't as, um, was empty a lot of the times. Yeah. Powerful stuff. But when you don't pair it with actual compassion or actual uh, tools and skills to cope with all those stuff, it can be anxious of, hey, I'm supposed to be president of the United States because they told me I can do it. I watched the Ninja Turtles. The Ninja Turtles told me I was awesome. <laughs> <That's Bunga. right. laughs> but I don't feel, right. you know, this way inside. I'm lost. So Right. What's wrong with me? Why aren't I president of the United right. States? Yeah. I what's just followed the Ninja me? Turtles. Right. What's <laughs> Um, I just, I, I want to interject just, and just hammer home something I'm hearing too, which is when our traumas as children don't get addressed, mm-hmm. right. They move with you from one stage of your life to the next stage to the next stage. And mm-hmm. while we could, well, maybe you can reflect on, well, uh, maybe I'm grateful to have found out at all that I had anxiety as a kid or to have realized that okay, some of these things I was going through were maybe attributed to my anxiety or being an anxious person. Um, But that when these things aren't being addressed, right? And which is why why Abby and I want to talk about about anxiety and podcasting because we want more folks like all of us, like everyone everywhere to start acknowledging and addressing these, not just childhood traumas or or, um, these relationships we have to the way that we feel, and bring, shed the light on them, shine the light mm-hmm. on them because everybody mm-hmm. not, I mean, we all experience different levels and it's a, it's a spectrum of trauma and anxiety and no one's story is the same. Each one is very, very special and unique. Um, mm-hmm. But right, the word anxiety umbrellas a lot of different things. And so yeah. the more we can discuss these things and um, reflect upon them, the more likely we are to be able to break down some of those traumas right. moving forward. And, and since right. you're, you're in the business of serving other people too, and Abby and I have said many times on the podcast that when we feel safe in our nervous systems, when we feel safe mm-hmm. and served, we're going to be able to better show up for um, others, family, community, students, uh, in relationships and, and the like. So with this in mind, I would love for you to share um, some of the ways in which you notice or notice anxiety manifesting in your body, your mind, your behaviors. Y'all probably noticed right now, I've been sitting on my hands, I'm wringing my hands, moving, my chest feels tight. Um, 
Yeah, mind racing all over the place, trying to think of the next thing to say hey, to protect myself mm-hmm. from sounding stupid, from feeling stupid, inadequate, um, not knowing what to yep. do with my, you know, my physical body. Yeah. Uh, really, sometimes going through my mind to search for the right words, the right voice to even project to express something to cover up my anxiety. Like you said, a lot of the traumas and anxieties that we don't address. But well, we put a dress on it. We cover it up. We try yeah. to make it up and put it in a certain sense of uh, of somewhere. Um, a lot of times when I, I get anxious, I do a whole lot of snacking. I'm a snacker. <laughs> you know, so I, I get to snacking. I'm like, wow, I've had a whole bunch of guac and chips was really mm. on my mind, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so my body tells me a lot of when, my, when I'm anxious. My body tells me a lot when I'm anxious or as I got into the practice of uh, clinical practices, as well as meditative practices, if I sit down for my daily meditation and it's a struggle, uh, I don't feel that that peace kind of wash over me. It's like, okay, there's really something down deep in there. I gotta go mm. deeper. Um, if I can't really jump into my routine without being somewhere else it's like okay it's, it's something there so my mind and my body whenever they're telling me that wherever you are wherever I'm currently I'm my present thoughts or whatever like that is is too much for me my mind and my body always tell me to trying to cover it up with food or trying to make myself feel good mm-hmm. through you know wringing my hands or even just not being able to sit down mentally or physically yeah I know that anxiety is going on. Restlessness, yeah. 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 And uh, I think restlessness is definitely modeled for me too. uh, It's a a, a line from Most Def, who's a, his name is Yasin Bey now, but he he has a line that says, my restlessness is my nemesis. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm all over the place and stuff. I can't sit down. I can't really bring that peace to my, to my mind. Yeah. But as a young man, as a man in general, a lot of times restlessness is rewarded. I'm getting up early. I'm taking care of business. I'm mowing the lawn. I'm going to work. I'm doing 12 things. I'm all over the mm-hmm. place, you know, and I've seen that modeled for me, uh, for men in my life of, you know, you don't want to be called lazy. You want to be right. productive. You right. got to be doing something at all times. So, um, you know, growing up, seeing other kids, oh, you better get off stop playing them video games all day. You better hurry up and get up and do something. You got to move. You got to just. So now I have a lot of restless energy and uh, I have a schedule full of things to keep me going. I feel like Um, that is such a common thread with anxiety is the restlessness, but then feeling rather than like pausing and caring for ourselves, which it sounds like you're like starting to like implement more and more like, oh, my mind's all over the place. Let me dig deeper. But that restlessness, like we're told in our society, like you need to be productive to be worthy. You know, you need to be working, work hard, play hard, as opposed to like, work part-time, have fun with other humans, like right. rest. Right. And so, right. Rest a little bit, not restlessness. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I really just want to um, just hit on what you said at the very beginning about your mind racing and how your mm-hmm. mind wants to race for saying the right thing. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like we haven't said enough about that when we're talking about anxiety, right? Like we might talk about mind racing, but part of it is let me, let me sound smart. Let me sound, you know, whatever it is to protect myself. It's, it's a form of protection. Um, and, and anxiety is a way it's like our nervous system wanting to protect us. And, and so I just like, I just thought it was amazing that that was the part you said, like my mind is racing and it wants to say the next right thing. It, it definitely is. Um, I have an education, uh, Sally May, who got my loan? She can tell you I got an education. Yeah, yeah. She, um, she got mine too. <laughs> Damn, Sally Bay. <laughs> yeah. Why did I bring her up? <laughs> I really got an triggered. Now. I feel like I feel like very like sirens going off in the back of my yeah. brain. Right? She reminded me for months how much I owed her. Right. <laughs> months and months and months and months, years, <laughs> years. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I, I got my education with her, but at the same time, there's still always that sense of I don't know enough. I don't yeah. have the answers. Um, I need more training. I need more education. I need somebody else to tell me this. Where's my guru at? Where's my retreat that's going to give me the this or the that or whatever yes. like that? Um, and it, it really takes away my ability to just pull from inside myself because of that constant sense of it ain't nothing in there yeah. because uh, whatever, whatever. Um, but you're learning to trust that has been helpful. But I still do it, especially as a speaker, as a, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yoga teachers, you, you feel like if you come into, if you go into a yoga class, you feel like a yoga teacher is, is just standing up there with um, a Bible in their hand or like the, the sutras in their hand and just like spitting out all this amazing things that have just been just directed to them straight from the highest power. Like, oh my God, how are they reading my life? Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I, I just spending that time of like, I just want to sound like them. I want to affect people and I want to have those words come from yeah. me. They just have a direct call to the ether to pull out these amazing, astounding things. And when that doesn't come out the first time or when I try to force it out, when I try to, you know, say something profound or whatever like that, and then I'm, uh, you know, it's frustrating. So it's like, just, yeah. just rest and relax, man. Yeah. You know, and know that we're enough. Like right? it, this all. is a common theme we've been here. <laughs> and it, this is, it's like reading our minds, <laughs> Abby and I, but also everyone we've spoken to, right. We all kind of share a lot of us anxiety warriors share this general hum beneath the surface of you're not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of X, Y, Z. I need to learn more. I need to read more. I need to go, go, go. Otherwise I'm a failure or I'm lazy or and mm -hmm. these narratives are being, uh, they're in our heads, let's be honest, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what's being fed to us in, in, uh, in media, in society, and through family pressure, or whatever the situation, we're, we're constantly being sent these mixed messages. Or now they're mixed, right? You're like, okay, there's mm -hmm. this, you're supposed to be taking care of yourself. You're supposed <laughs> to be prioritizing rest and self-care and buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. And then you're also mm -hmm. supposed to you know, become an entrepreneur and make right. crap loads of money. And it's right. just like, how do you reconcile these two things? And so I just yeah. deeply resonated with all of that. Um, you know, when you and I had spoken before we were recorded a while back, you, you said something that I found really interesting. And I'd love for you to share more about this to our listeners. You kind of said that you weren't sure as you were growing up, how you were supposed to show up in this world. And I feel like this kind of ties into what we're talking mm -hmm. about you know, at home and at school. And you mentioned feeling this need to perform a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And you told this amazing story about how when you went to college, you the plan for you was to become a new person. Mm -hmm. So like, I would just love for you to share because I feel like this is something that a lot of people can relate to. It's like you, you're all right. It's a chance to um, start over in a way and uh, be a little bit more outspoken or less worried about judgment or show yourself in the world. But then the anxious part of you maybe keeps you from stopping that performance. And so I feel right. like it'd be great to hear for you to share more about that experience if you can. Sure, definitely. It was 2004 in the summer of 2004, I think. I know I probably had a, a big white tall tee on and some big jeans and you know, some Air Force Ones and stuff. And I was, I graduated from college, high school. I made it out of high school. And I had the opportunity to go to school in Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana. So, I mean, this is literally a plane ride away from my friends, my family, and the life that my anxiety created during high school. Hmm. A big part of my high school was playing football. It, um, it sheltered me because it gave me an identity. Oh, I'm a football player. I really don't always feel connected with them as much, but I'm a football player. It gives me something to do after school. It makes me feel like I'm doing something so I can continuously feel that sense of not enoughness. And now I'm leaving all that behind to go to college. And I have the opportunity to create a whole new identity. I get to be one of the cool people I see on TV. I get to be like the other young black men that I see or hear about. I get to be somebody that stands up for themselves. I get to be somebody who assertive, somebody who's cool, somebody who the ladies like, somebody who the fellas enjoy being around. 
like I get to be all this person because I'm leaving my home. I'm leaving behind all the things that shaped me into being this anxious, undeserving person that I am here in California. So as soon as I get there, um, I just, I, I really started kind of acting distant from my parents. Like, yeah, hey, hurry up, y'all drop me off. And then you take that old James with me and I'm gonna mm -hmm. create this new James here. Um, I started trying to wear hats. Like I've never been a hat person, but I, I wanted to give an actual physical representation to the internal shedding that I thought I was going through. So, all right, let me put on a hat. Let me let everybody else know, yo, my name is Callie and I'm from Cali. Uh, I'm, are you from LA? No, nah, not really LA, but you know, kind of close to LA. And just doing this whole performance of who I thought people would like me to be and who really, who they really thought I can, um, they could connect with. And I, it probably lasted a week or a couple of weeks or something like that till the regular James just came out. And it really blew me away that as the regular James came out, people still really disliked me. They just enjoyed me for me. I built lifelong friends from my freshman year of college and I still talk to and still connect with. And so it took a little bit of the pressure of trying to be somebody else off when I found some people who connected with me, who I authentically was, and kind of laughed at the person that I was trying to be. Like, oh, remember you wearing that hat and stuff? Like, what was that about? Um, so yeah, it was, and I and I and even looking back at that now, I think that was kind of when I first had the even the, the mindset that okay, all this stuff is in my head and I can just change it if I think differently. Mm. And and trying to chase that as well. Like, all right, there's a, like you said earlier, there's going to be another book that can change me. There's going to be another thing that can change me. So kind of keeping in that thread of the next thing is going to change me. Um, even though I found acceptance in that college, in my college friends, I found acceptance in other things. But, you know, I'm still just working to find acceptance in myself. So yeah yeah I so I just I love like the going to the external first because that's I feel like mm -hmm. when we're feeling not enough when we're feeling like we want to fit in when we're looking for people that will be part of our community it's like oh let me change the external I'll right. wear a hat I'll call myself right. something different I'll try to like yeah. you know and like you learned what you said like one two weeks pretty quickly right, like wait right. a second this is <laughs> <keep this up. laughs> you know and I I did that in college too I wore like different shirts like that had different <laughs> name brands on them so I would be accepted and you know like so I can yeah, so relate to yeah, the yeah. external but ultimately what it goes back to is you realize like wait a second like this comes to my mindset this comes to my core mm -hmm. of who I am I can wear all the hats I want, but I'm still with me on the inside. And this is the stuff that has to be, you know, cared for yeah. and addressed. Right, right. Cared for, addressed and loved and mm -hmm. accepted and nurtured. Because uh, yeah. I spent a lot of energy in just trying to change it. Right. And even pushed away a lot of good people who accept, accepted it. Like, mm. like, we accept you for who you are. And I'm like, no, but this person sucks. You don't know. Yeah. Like, I know him. This person's not enough. It's like, no, it's enough for the love that we're giving you right now. Take it. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to learn that. Yeah, I love that you just said it in the present tense. I'm trying to learn that, right? Because it's something that we're constantly, everything we share here is typically viewed through the lens of this is an active practice, moving through mm -hmm. anxiety, mm -hmm. moving through the general hum of like, be better, do better, learn more which those pressures, like Abby said, they come from the way our, the, our narrative, our mindset. And you had those people telling you, no, no, we love you. And you mm -hmm. were the one kind of like, no, no, don't love that person. Love what's wrong with guy. you all? <laughs> if you right, love me, right, what's wrong right. with you? <laughs> like, right. Yeah. yeah. And I think so many people can relate to, to those general feelings. Thank you so much for um, diving a little bit deeper on that. Uh, another really great part of our call that I love to know more about, and I think everyone would love to hear is, um, how you, you've kind of been sharing a little bit about how over the years you've kind of stepped into your own authenticity and mm -hmm. uh, how being the true James Woods is what everybody really, really needs. It's what everyone wants and what they love. And so you shared a little bit about your work in a group home, working with mm -hmm. um, uh, young adults and with adults with um, 
neurodiversity and, and different needs. And so mm-hmm. I, I'd love to hear more about your journey with, uh, or we'd love to hear more hearing about your journey with those, with those people and how that impacted you. That was a huge part of shifting in my life towards where I'm at right now, especially career wise and just understanding myself. So I come back home after college. Yay, I made it four years in college and graduating in the city of New Orleans. That's a mm-hmm. few, so much yes. party and stuff going yes. on. <laughs> <laughs> I made it out of four years that I came all the way back to California. I still don't know why, but I came back to California. Couldn't get a job. Um, I had this big shiny new degree, but it was in 2008 and the crash was mm-hmm. at its height and I couldn't get a job. And so after scowling Craigslist for hours and hours, I found a job working in a group home. Didn't really even know what a group home was. It was just like, all right, they paying. Mm-hmm. Wasn't paying enough because I had to work two jobs in two different group homes. And one of them, as you said, was, was with uh, adults who had different neurological needs and were uh, permanently residents at this home. And then another was a group of young men who were on probation. Mm-hmm. Now they had spent some time in juvenile hall um, and it was a diverse group. It was some gang kids. It was some kids who just were, um, into like theft and pyro, uh, it was arson, arson, and set things on fire and things like that. Just, and kids that, you know, they, they've been through a whole lot, but both of these groups of individuals, these young men and these older men really constantly put a mirror to myself of who I was trying to be and who I really was. So mm. um, like the far, one of the first days getting there, one of the kids gets into a fight with another one of the kids. I mean, they're just going at it hardcore and I'm trying to break them up and they're not really listening to me. And I'm coming in kind of soft and nice and pleasant. Like, hey, I have a degree. I have a, let me use my psychology one-on-one techniques on you. And they wasn't trying to hear that. What they really was trying to hear was who I was. Like, yeah. come on, like, be real. Yeah. Talk to me, you know. Mm. And a lot of them were, um, a lot of them were just amazed at my life because I knew my father, because I knew who my mother was, because I didn't come up around drugs and gangs. They were just like, yo, like, your life is like that. And especially coming up listening to hip hop me feeling sometimes even embarrassed for coming up in the suburbs because me thinking that, hey, if you you black, you're young, you come from the hood. So they were just really fascinated at that. And it gave me an opportunity to start to release a lot of the false narrative I had in my life by really allowing them to take a peek into who I am and me just listening to them. I mean, because they had some real life struggles and we all had to lay it out to get past it. We all had to show each other who we really are and who we really were. And with the adults, they, a lot of times they were on heavy medication and a lot of times they were just, they were just raw human emotions. Mm -hmm. They was just raw human emotions. So it wasn't the whole social things that we learned how to protect ourselves. It was just, I'm hungry or I'm this or I'm that. I just want to be loved. I just want to be cared for. I just need your attention. And it was like, wow, this is who I am without all the crap that I put on myself to try to be, to try to fit in and stuff. Like really seeing people at their raw core on both sides as these young boys were developing. And then as these older men were really coming back to a place of just being human beings. And it really just showed me a lot. And it gave me a lot of freedom to be who I am and to connect with myself on a deeper level. And so I'm always grateful for um, that time with them. And I actually saw one of them a couple of years later, saw one of the, the boys and uh, he probably was high when I seen him, he, mm-hmm. you know, he's still doing his thing coping, but he had a job and he mm-hmm. was um, working and doing his thing. And he was, when he seen me, he thought I was one of the other kids that was in the group home. Like, oh man, <laughs> you made it out too. Cause he couldn't really remember me all the way. Right. But just, um, I thanked him. I thanked him immensely for it just showing me uh, what it was like to be authentic yeah. and to be real and right. to take value in who you are as a person. And, and ultimately, like I have chills during the story, like it sounds like 
them reflecting to you that you needed to be yourself <laughs> and be honest and Kids be do human, right? right? Also, like who knows how you impacted them because you were honest and human and showing that it's okay to be human with each other. We don't always have to protect each other and put these layers on and pretend things are better when they're not or whatever it is. Like you, you provided a like relational home for them by being yourself. Right. I can relate to that idea though, about like, right. It's like you're, you're the one leading, you're teaching, they're looking to you. And so I've been in that, not that situation, but in a situation where it's like, okay, put your teacher hat on. Let's try to fix the problem. Let's try to just, you know, um, not actually be as open and vulnerable as I know maybe these kids actually need or want me to be, but I'll just try to fix it with all the knowledge that I got from school Mm -hmm. and all those great books and everything. So I think that, um, yeah, highly, highly relatable yeah. on that note, but just the, the pleasure of finding your, your authenticity that way is, is amazing. Uh, yeah. When you were saying that, it made me also think like, we're told, you know, especially when you come right from out of college, like we're told you have to be professional. And I right. think sometimes when we're told you have to be professional, we, we leave out our humanness in that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And so it's like, part of being professional can mean we can be real. Like, right. Yeah. Right. I mean, like I graduated and a few months ago. I was, you know, just playing beer pong and hanging out with my friends and stuff like that. Now, just a couple months later, I'm supposed to be this super professional person, you know. And the kids just, just, just call it out on you. Like, come on, man. You know right. Who you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Immediately, they don't give you a two seconds to to not be yourself. Right. Yeah. You're either you you either have to be yourself or they want nothing to do with you, and then you can't really it. connect. That's um. It. So it's thinking about this, just what we're saying about that uh, the professionalism and, and you've t- shared a little bit about your journey to finding yoga and how you wound up. Uh, I think it was, you had told me when we chatted about how you were told you had to go to therapy in order to get your degree, right? That was part right. of your education. And so you also spoke about how these two practices or these two um, things really, really helped you navigate your anxiety and still do. So I'd love for you to share more about how yoga and therapy um, work for you as far as a coping strategies and, and what are some of your other go-tos for coping with your anxiety? Okay. Therapy really helps me to have a, a conversation with myself as I'm bouncing ideas and things off my therapist. It's like, oh, wow, James, that sounds stupid. Well, let's not have that again. Let's let that go. And just being able to express and get things out verbally. I uh, grew up kind of as a quiet kid. So speaking to other people was something I wasn't comfortable with. But now having someone just to speak to who's unbiased and, you know, um, I can express whatever to has been helpful. And it also helps me put putting labels on some of my emotions, some of my feelings, so I can recognize it. Like, James, there's nothing wrong. You just, that's just anxiety. And that's all that is. It is a little nervousness. When I put a label on it, I can put it in the box and I have a bunch of tools that I can go to to take care of what's in that box. So it helps me to um, operate, organ, helps me to organize, organize my feelings and my emotions and compartmentalize them in a healthy way where I'm, I'm able to address them, not just stuff them down, but it's like, hey, this is what I'm feeling right now. And even when I don't know what I'm feeling, that's okay. And that's a huge part of the yoga coming in. Yoga really gives me that space and that opportunity within myself just to have an experience of a human being, uh, to breathe, to move, to be still. It creates a sense of, hey, James, you are constantly expanding, you are constantly growing. And in that constant expansion and growth, you're gonna be anxious, you're gonna be nervous, you're gonna be sad, you're gonna be this, you're gonna be that. But just keep breathing, keep moving, and you can get through it, you can go through it. Um, I, initially, I got into yoga because um, I was just trying to stretch. I wanted to touch my toes in a forward <laughs> fold and that wasn't happening. And so I wanted to stretch and, um, it really turned out to be something more. It turned out to be a place where I can put a lot of my emotion into uh, through a physical practice and through an understanding. And I'm still a baby in this whole yoga thing. So I'm starting to get to 
learn it even on a, on a, the different levels. Um, and it, it just, it gives me a lot of space to be myself. And I'm very appreciative of it for that. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I feel like we all can, I mean, the three of us at least can, can relate to how transformative yoga and breathing and, and identifying emotions are. And, you know, I think, you know, growing up, you know, especially in the eighties, you know, we're told there's no place for emotions. We're not told that all emotions are valid. We're told that like the unpleasant ones we need to hide. Um, But that just creates more of a disconnect between us and ourselves when we can't experience all the emotions. And so um, right. yeah, it's just, it's so, it can be so transformative when you give yourself the space to be with yourself and your emotions and your body and your breath and see right. what comes up. Mm-hmm. And, and just for folks listening out who may be interested in yoga, just straight up yoga makes you feel good. And in those times where you feel good, you're able to think a little bit clearer. Yeah. So the more I do yoga, the more I feel good. Mm. The more I do yoga, the more I have those opportunities to feel good and to think clear. And that's just the basis of it for me. I'm expanding my feel good. I'm taking my feel good from a little bit to a lot, whatever yoga practice. I like that. Expanding my feel good. Yeah. Just again, to those who most, most people who are listening so far, right. They, they know that Abby and I are yoga and mindfulness teachers. And so a lot of what we talk about that helps us has stems from the practice. Uh, but just know too, that when you hear us say yoga, that doesn't mean go throw yourself into some fancy pose, right? Don't, you don't have to unroll a mat. I know that that can sometimes be the thought that immediately goes to people's minds. Like, okay, do yoga to feel good. Wow. That means I better unroll a yoga mat for 60 minutes a day and go hard at it. Otherwise I'm, I'm feeling at yoga. So just know that a pause, a moment of reflections, a couple of deep inhales and exhales, that's doing yoga too. Yoga is such a a vast practice. So, and I I love that you highlighted that you still feel like a baby in yoga. I love that because I think everybody still feels like a baby. I don't care how many years you've been practicing. (laughs) The practice is new every time you do it. Right. And it could be as simple as just pausing to just notice how you feel. And that isn't always easy, even for those of us that teach this stuff all the time. (laughs) Uh, All all right. So um, if you could go back in time, and give yourself, your younger self, one bit of advice, what would it be? Keep going, keep going. Just keep walking, keep moving, keep going. It all makes sense. Um, The stuff that you're going through right now, it'll pass. The Mm -hmm. feelings and stuff, they're heavy, they're big right now. Just just keep going, keep moving. I think, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I go back in my past and tell myself that because otherwise, I, because sometimes I don't, I don't know how I got through stuff. So I'm like, man, maybe my future self came back and just <laughs> left that note or, you know, <laughs> sent that message or just whispered something in my ear, opened the door or whatever, something for me, but definitely would tell my uh, younger self, keep going and, um, and uh, start wearing smaller jeans. i love that you're the first person that's like brought something other than like that these grand ideas for what you would share with your younger self right it's like also maybe that splatter paint jacket that you wore was a problem maybe the 90s was a problem (laughs) right remember all those chokers you used to wear margo maybe the chokers (laughs) remember when you wore a ring on every finger (laughs) Oh, right. I wore like Freaking oversized Liberace. Looney Tune shirts. Like, come on. Uh, <laughs> Which character, though? Bird, right. Which character? I think it was Tasmanian Devil. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's funny. I love that it was Tasmanian Devil. That's perfect. Oh, gosh. That's perfect for you. Okay. We're, that's a whole other conversation, everybody. <laughs> All right. Um, so, last question What does being an anxiety warrior mean to you? Being an anxiety warrior means whenever a situation comes up that triggers anxiety within me, uh, being able to recognize it's anxiety and it's not me. Mm. I think just being able to start there. Um, I have a because I I have a choice from there to recognize when it's not me. 
I can kind of cave into it and like, uh, here we go, nachos and guacamole. That's all right too. Or I can sit down and meditate on it or, you know, do something to really try to get through it in a certain way. Or I could just let it um, take me for that day and come back another day. But really acknowledging, all right, that wasn't me that, you know, got taken out or whatever that fell off, whatever I was trying to do. That was just my anxiety. And tomorrow I got some, I got some for you tomorrow. This anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> the choices. You're, you're, the, the choices. choices. Yeah. 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 I mean, anxiety drives a lot of behaviors that like, I know for me, I used to feel ashamed or embarrassed about, or I mean, even now, like even now when my anxiety makes it where I'm having big emotions and I'm uncomfortable around other people, right? It's like, it's not me. It's my anxiety doing this. And when right. we can label it, then we have that choice of like, what can I do now? Now that I see how anxiety is manifesting right now. Right. Right, yeah. right, right. And you can give her, you can give him or her a name too, like I do. My anxiety's <laughs> name's Bertha. Bertha. She's just, she's always kind of hanging out nearby. Sometimes she's little, sometimes she's huge, right? But when you sort of acknowledge, like you're right. saying, James, so flawlessly, acknowledge the presence and know mm-hmm. there is nothing wrong with me. My girl Bertha's just here. She's <laughs> visiting. She needs some support, which basically is I need support, right? And I love that you said like, hey, maybe this is just not my day. Yeah. Right. And just the idea of like, we don't have to necessarily fix it, move through it right now. It could be a while. And it's okay to sit with and be with without having to just be like, oh God, e- even more is wrong with me because I can't move through it right now, right? It's okay right. to go to bed with it if, it, if if that's what you need that day. So I love that you brought that in. All right. We are going to do some lightning round. Get to know James Woods a little better questions. Lightning (laughs) round. We don't have a sting. (laughs) I say it every time. We make different sounds every time Abby and I were like lightning round. (laughs) Or like. (laughs) So we're just going to go back and forth, Abby and myself, asking you a different fun, hopefully not anxiety inducing question. (laughs) Yeah. Although we've heard that, you know, sometimes it's like, ah. So take a breath, take a minute. You don't have to answer super fast, even though the word lightning is in the title. It's okay to pause. (laughs) All right, Abby, do you want to lead us? Okay. All right. Um, So if you could pick up like a certain skill instantly, any skill, you snap your fingers and then you have that skill, what would the skill be? Speaking Spanish. I've been working on it for years. Uh, Speaking Spanish, fluent in Espanol. (laughs) Love it. Okay. Good one though. Right. Just learning a language is yeah. such a hard skill. So I would love that. It is. Okay. What is your favorite word? Free. Mm. And in all aspects, mm-hmm. like, um, I like free stuff and I'm really am working to not have to work at feeling free. Yeah. Free, 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 free 99. Okay. all right if you were a sound what sound would you be and could you make it (laughs) i think that mm. Mm. (laughs) 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 is that the sound of freedom Mm. (laughs) that's the sound of those chips and guacamole (laughs) It's wild that you just said that because I almost made that joke. I was like, I'm talking a lot about chips and guac and now I've been thinking about it and you just said, mm, and I'm like, chips and guac, chips and guac, chips and guac. <laughs> it's just like in my brain. Oh, man. Everyone uh, stop the, for some chips and guac. <laughs> yeah, please. That's the sound of me acknowledging how delicious life is. Mm. Life is very delicious. Yep, it just makes you go, mm, this is some good stuff here. Love it. That's great. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Last question from me. Did you have a childhood nickname? And if you did, what was it? Panther. 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 Um, Yep. As soon as I came out, um, I was a 10 pound baby. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I've never had a baby before, but I I feel like that's a lot. And (laughs) when I came out, I was screaming very loud. I had a very loud scream cry. And so my aunt was like, ooh, he's screaming like a panther. And she still calls me that to this day. Oh, I love it. 
yeah i know panther sounds like black panthers i'm all warrior and stuff but no yep just, panther right there. just a screamer just screaming like a panther <laughs> um last question for me is this yes this is final one okay complete the sentence i wish everyone could see how complete and beautiful they are mm -hmm. Yeah. Well done. You did that fast. Yeah. <laughs> so these yeah. are twinkles. <laughs> yes. We send twinkles, which are just like my heart sees your heart. <laughs> we see you. Right. It's like it's not lightning finger. <laughs> twinkle and sparkles. Yeah. We call them twinkles, sparkle and shine. Amazing. Oh my gosh. All right. So we are gonna end with uh, a little segment called win of the week. So, James, do you have a win big or small from this week? Um a big win this week was getting some coaching. I'm in a, a coaching program, of course, and I got some, some coaching on some direction about the work that I'm doing. And it was aligned with the work I have been doing. It was like uh, pulling together all the stuff that I've been doing over the years and putting it in a nice, nice, nice neat bow. So I'm excited nice. about that. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking on that, Tell everyone where they can find you, a little bit about uh, your work, the services you provide, and, and how they can connect. Cool, sure. And uh, another win also was being on this podcast with y'all. Y'all are Aww. fun. We got some good laughs and stuff, man. It's very therapeutic and helpful awesome. for me as well. You can find me at that yoga dude, D as in dog, A T Y O G A D U D E, that yoga dude.com, Instagram, Facebook. LinkedIn. I'm on TikTok now too. That yoga dude. Um, I haven't done a dance yet. I may do a little dance or something. Uh, yes. Yeah, that yoga dude.com. You can email me um, at yoga dude.com. Call my phone 951 264 5467. That's my real number. Wow, that's a first. <laughs> <laughs> Love You'll it. have to tell us how it pays off. <laughs> you people call. <laughs> You're not Sally Mae. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, no Sally Mae is allowed. <laughs> no Sally Mae is allowed. Yeah, All right. Well, All right. Amazing. And for everyone who isn't following James on IG, highly recommend. James mm -hmm. has these amazing 15 seconds of freedom videos that I like, I legit live for. <laughs> Cause it, it, they're just, it's, you give the droppiest wisdom bombs in 15 seconds. And then I can just like, be like, yeah, okay, Margo, you've got that. Do that, do that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. Thank and uh, we, we think all you warriors will enjoy it. So um, James, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so yeah. much for being a guest and uh, sharing and being open and honest about your anxiety journey with us and all the warriors out there. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Really appreciate you. Oh my gosh. It was so fun reliving this conversation with James. Yes. I just, you know, he, he's just got such a calming way. He's mm -hmm. got such a calming presence. And it's so funny that so many people say that about you and I, right? It's like, I feel safe and calm in your presence. And it's like, but we all have this anxiety bubbling. It's always beneath the surface yeah. or a good amount of time it is. So yeah. I just think it's so interesting. Right. The external doesn't always match the internal <laughs> experience. Yeah. yeah. Which we talked about a little mm -hmm. bit on the pod. Yeah. So takeaways from this episode. I know for me, I could really resonate with his whole idea of like, not feeling enough. I mean, we've yeah. talked about this over and over again and yeah. um, just like that we should be going and doing and uh, learning more and constantly growing. Otherwise you're not doing life right. Right. And that causes so much anxiety. I know it does right. for me. And so I love that, that part of our conversation. And, um, you know, he also just shares so much about what it means to be his authentic self and how he really learned to stop performing and wearing all those hats. I, I loved reliving that part of our conversation because I think so many of us can relate to a time in our lives or maybe currently when we're trying to be 
we're trying to be, we're trying to be a certain way, look Mm -hmm. a certain way to hopefully feel better on the inside. Again, more of that like external versus internal um, way of being. So I loved that, that authenticity conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It takes, it takes a lot to feel safe, feel comfortable showing up as yourself. Um, And I think we're all like learning that on, on this journey is just how can we feel okay being ourselves and enough being ourselves. Um, you know, I, I, one of the takeaways, uh, for me was just really how, how long it takes for change to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and because he was sharing how in the eighties, you know, his parents had learned, um, to let the baby cry it out. And I won't talk about having babies and sleep training. Like I won't get into that. But what I will say is in the eighties, that was the way for, to deal with crying babies. And now (laughs) in 2021, um, there's a lot of research out there on how that might not support babies. Um, And it takes that long for that information to reach the public. Right. And so it's just like how many children in the 80s were not held, were not soothed when they were crying. And again, share that that journey with James where there's always this like I have to meet my own needs. Right. No one else can meet them because that's ultimately the message you get as an infant is if no one is meeting your needs then you learn that you have to do it yourself. Yeah. You know, I also valued in, in James highlighting the fact that when, when traumas are not met, when yeah. they're not addressed, they're going, they're, they're just going to get glossed over mm-hmm. and they're just going to, you're just going to keep living and moving, but nothing ever really gets better or fixed. Yeah. It just yeah. continues. It's that vicious cycle. Yeah. Yeah. And just remembering that it's a constant practice. Yeah. We just keep saying this over and over again, that noticing our anxiety and he kind of highlight, he kind of highlights this in, um, as one of his coping strategies, which is to at first acknowledge the fact that you're feeling anxiety or this isn't, there's nothing actually wrong with, with me or how I'm handling the situation. I'm just experiencing anxiety. Yeah. And, uh, I resonated with just the idea of, we can have choices when we notice our anxiety, when we practice recognizing anxiety for what it is, we can give ourselves um, more options for how to explore moving through it. And I also valued him saying that it's kind of okay if it, maybe it doesn't happen till tomorrow. Right. 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 I love that piece. Like it's not who I am. It's my anxiety. Right. Right. Like when we are behaving in a way that we feel uncomfortable with or ashamed about or bad about or whatever it is. Right. It's like, sure. Yes, it's a part of us, but also it's not who we are. (laughs) It's our anxiety that is causing us to feel this way and act this way. And then in that we have choice, like you just said. We can take care of it. We can let it be. We can, you know, whatever it is. Um, but it doesn't define us. Like these, you know, unpleasant behaviors and feelings don't define us. They aren't who we are, which I really thought was just so beautifully said in our conversation with him. Yes. Yeah, so everyone go find James yes. on Instagram. Uh, reach out to him uh, if you're interested in in the work that he does. And he even dropped his phone number. His digits. <laughs> yeah. A brave, bold Call choice. Him up. <laughs> he's, a, he's a fun guy to talk to. So definitely. Totally recommend just chatting <laughs> with James. If you want to talk to an authentic person, he's he's your man. Yeah. Uh, oh my goodness, Warriors. Thank you so much for being with us this week. And uh, we really hope you enjoyed our conversation with James Woods. We look forward to hearing from you. If you want to talk to us, you want to reach out, you know where to find us now. Maybe if you've been listening for a bit, we're on Instagram at Anxiety Warriors Podcast, or you can feel free to shoot us an email at Anxiety Warriors Podcast at gmail.com and let us know your wins of the week, how you're feeling about the pod. Uh, if there's a specific topic you're interested in hearing us chat about, we'd love to hear from you. And, or if you feel like you'd be an amazing Anxiety Warrior Podcast guest, we'd love to hear that too. So, reach out. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for going on this journey with us. We're so grateful you're here. We love you warriors till next time. <laughs>